I had um, very happy memories of my identical twin sons as, as children. I just have many joyful, happy memories of them as fun-loving boys who loved sport, um, who were a little bit mischievous at school, and uh, who had ambitions one day to become Britain's downhill ski champions because they loved to go skiing. But um, behind all of that, we didn't know that there was a lot of drug use going on. Nicholas and Simon, along with many of their friends, had picked up cigarettes and alcohol um, quite early into their teens. Um, and from inquisitive behaviour that young people often have in trying things to see, if, see what it's like. And that led to trying other drugs, other recreational drugs as well. So when their grandmother indicated to me that she felt something was wrong, um, that was the kind of first indication looking, looking at their eyes um, and that they were starting perhaps to be a little bit more um, laid back about life and disinterested in themselves. Once they had progressed from smoking their first heroin joint, they then moved on to chasing the dragon and eventually became IV users. And one of the things that they chose to do as identical twins was to work hard at keeping it secret from the family. It was only at the point when Simon asked to meet me and he said to me, Mum, I have something to tell you. And I said, what is it? And he said, Mum, I'm a pinhead. And I said, I don't know what a pinhead is. Can you explain that? And that's when he rolled up the sleeves of his shirt and he showed me the track marks in his arms. Thoughts flashed through your head, such as, how long has this been going on for? Uh, is it my fault? Have I done something wrong to make you turn to drugs? Um, and you, then you begin to think, oh, is that where that money disappeared from that I thought that I misplaced? And it's like a jigsaw puzzle floating down like snowflakes as things start to fit into place. Find yourself doing all the things that you feel are really worthwhile doing, but actually are not necessarily, for example, paying off drug dealers and clearing debts and trying to rebuild the status quo, but not understand that standing that actually that's allowing you to enable them to continue their drug use. Um, in fact, the drug dealer further up the chain would offer them and their other friends who were addicts opportunities to sell drugs. He would say, you don't need to go out and commit crime for your fix because I'll pay you your fix for free if you'll sell me a thousand pounds worth of drugs. So to see your children's personalities change in the grip of addiction, to see them change into cheats and liars and petty criminals um, was very devastating. I took them to various rehabs like so many family members do, I made phone calls to rehabs and hospitals um, to get them well. Um, but of course, that was futile. It wasn't them that wanted to get well at that point. It was me that wanted them to get well. Our family wanted them to get well. I thought that when my sons went on synthetic opiates, the problems were over. That the first rehab that they set into, their problems were over. They were engaged in a programme with a synthetic opiate which they were able to collect daily from the chemist. I started to see evidence of them start looking just a little bit more normalised and so um, that was um, encouraging that the synthetic opiate might be helping them to bring some structure into their lives and to understand that um, only they could effectively put their lives back in order. But sadly, our journey, our lives were derailed with Nicholas's death in 2004, in February 2004. And two days before he died, I saw him looking quite well, even looking at uh, college courses uh, you know, to do at the local college and uh, looking forward to his future. Um, two days later, he went to a party with his brother and used drugs again and injected and had a very traumatic argument with his brother about the importance of trying to get off drugs 
and in the morning when his brother woke up, um, he found that he'd, he'd hung himself. So he took his own life at the age of 27. Next to Nicholas's body, we, when we opened this box thinking it would be have his phone in, we found that it contained the drug paraphernalia of his life and it contained the, the spoons that he heated the heroin on and the needles that he used um, and the steric wipes that seemingly he used um, on his veins. Um, that's the legacy that sadly he left us because everything else had been sold for what's in this box with, with huge honesty that um, the loss of Nicholas had the most traumatic impact on Simon. So he had to make some significant choices about his own life. Would he continue with his drug use? He slowly started to rebuild his relationships with members of the family who had lost trust, lost belief in him. Right, I think it took him five years before he had a credit worthy, worthy profile that he could have uh, a, a visa card or a bank account and get a mortgage and you have to do that bit by bit and show that you are determined to put your life right and for him it gave him Nicholas's death gave him his life back and so he he slowly steadily put his life back together again and so he's rebuilt and is in a very good place today. He's now married with two children of his own, completely drug and alcohol free, holding down a very good job. And of course, we are all enormously proud of him.